Amen, amen, amen. God can have it indeed all this morning. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. Happy Sabbath, Southside. Happy Sabbath. You guys look and sound good this morning. I just want to say thank you to Pastor Paige for extending the invitation to me this morning. A lot of you guys wouldn't know, but Pastor Paige and I went to seminary together. He, he finished there. I transferred to Loma Linda University School of Religion, but I found out something that you guys know very well, that Pastor Paige is a different man. I mean, you guys know style-wise, he's a very different man. He's very decked out and dressed to the nines. We were in seminary, and I remember in my first class that I ever had, I, he either sat next to me or I sat next to him. And the rest of us seminarians were wearing t-shirts and polos and jeans, but not Pastor Page. He was dressed a little bit higher than we were, and he still leads the charge in that in terms of his style. But even more importantly, he's always been known to be a preacher of righteousness. Amen. And he has been blessing me from afar as I watch the ministry that he's doing here and that he's done in his previous assignments. But also one thing I want you guys to know is that about every month or so, he and a group of friends of I and, and myself, we get together and I get to see the um, awesome and amazing pastor that he is because he always talks about you guys and how much he loves you. And so I hope you know that you, also, you have an awesome preacher in the house here at Southside, but awesome pastor as well. And then I have to say that he's a great brother in ministry anytime I need him. He's there anytime I need advice or prayer, I can count on him. So I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to share here at his church. My wife has already been recognized, but I have to say that I preach better when she's in the house. Amen. So I'm glad to see her and have her here and just a part of the ministry that God has entrusted to us. But before we go any further, shall we pray? Dear God, feed us in Jesus name. Amen. So. As I've come here, I, I feel really at home this morning, if I'm going to be real with you. And so can I call you guys family this morning? Yeah. Amen. So with family, you can be real, right? So family, I'm going to be real with you. I'm tired this morning. But it's not just this morning that I'm tired, and it's not because I did the almost hour drive from Duluth, which was fine, but it's because I've been tired for a while. And if you come from where I come from, to say that you're tired as a young person isn't a popular refrain. Oftentimes, if you're young and you say you're, t you're tired, you'll hear one or two things. You're too young to be tired. Another thing that's often said, if you're tired now, wait till you're older. And you know what? I, I hear that. I hear that. And I agree with it. But personally, for me, I've been going nonstop for the last four years or so. I've been working. I've been in grad school. I got married. I was living and moving in different in three different places. All that with everything else going on in my life. But guess what? My story isn't that different than yours. Whatever has been on our personal plates, we've all been dealing with this thing called life. And if we're real with ourselves, life has been hitting us all hard these past few years. You guys can think back just a few years back. Remember the pandemic? They said that life was going to slow down because of the pandemic. And yeah, some places closed down for gatherings, schools shut down. But even then, life kept on hitting us both left and right. And even since the pandemic, they said we would start having a different rhythm of life. And I'll be honest with you, I hate that phrase, a different rhythm of life. It sounds new age. It sounds kind of weird to me. But even then, we know that we've still been going and working at the same rate or even more than before. For some of us, that's staying at home because we have the ability to work from home, but we have kids at home, or that means being a caretaker for an elderly um, relative while we're working, for some of it's, it's braving that Atlanta traffic every single day while having to pick up and drop off our kids, whatever it may be, we haven't had that much time for rest. And you might be listening to everything I'm saying this morning. You might be saying, well, Pastor Jay, I came to church for a message of hope and inspiration. And everything that you're telling me right now is not making me feel that hopeful and it's not making me feel that inspired. But I want you to know that you came to the right place today because I've simply come today to talk about 
rest. Physical rest, mental rest, spiritual rest, rest. And as Pastor Page invited me to come today, he said that the church is going through a theme for this quarter called Growing Deeper in Christ. But I want you to know a secret, but this secret is one that I want you to not keep to yourself. If you ever tell me a secret, I'll keep it to myself. But if you tell me that I can tell other people, I get pretty excited. So the secret about rest and the secret about growth, rather, in order to grow, you have to learn how to rest. And I learned this by I'm getting trying to get back into the gym. You know, I'm I'm trying to lose some some fat. And oftentimes what the personal trainers will tell you, you can work out six days a week, seven days a week, but if you're only getting about four hours of rest, you will not grow. Well, I want you to know that the same thing happens with our spiritual lives. We can go, go, go. We can be in the word, but if we're not resting, if we're not trusting in God, then we can't grow. So today, y'all, I'm here to talk about finding rest in Jesus especially in the midst in a storm, because if we can learn how to rest in Jesus, we can grow in Jesus. So as I was thinking about a biblical passage that could guide our time today, I started to walk through the scriptural neighborhood, so to speak, and I started going through Genesis and Exodus and some of the Old Testament chapters, and I started going through the New Testament, and I found a tree that happened to be the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 4. And there it, it gave me some insight into what could actually guide our thoughts for finding rest in Jesus. And so I decided to sit down underneath this tree. And I want you to know something about my preaching today is that I'll often reference the text often because it'll never be what I said, but what I read. Amen. So today, we, again, we find ourselves in the Gospel of Mark chapter 4. And we're going to start at verse 35, and I'll read for you as you follow along. And and it says this, On that day, when the evening had come, he, meaning Jesus, told them, let's cross over to the other side of the sea, the Sea of Galilee. So they left the boat and took him alongside, alongside him since he was in the boat, and the other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. He was in the stern sleeping on the cushion, so they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we're even about to die? He got up. He rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Silence, peace, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Then he said to them, meaning the disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked one another, who then is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Today, we're talking about finding rest in Jesus, but more simply, we're talking about faith and rest. Now, this is a pretty familiar text, and Pastor Page has probably preached from this before. You guys are probably seasoned theologians at this point. But I think it's pretty important that we know the context of what we're dealing with. And so the story of the sea storm found here in the Gospel of Mark picks up right after Jesus has given a series of sermons. And they're pretty historic ones. You know them, the parable of the sower and the parable of the growing seed, and then the parable of the tiny mustard seed, that if we have a faith the size of a tiny mustard seed, God can move mountains. But here we find Jesus preaching to a crowd so large that he has to step back and get onto a boat and speak so that everyone could hear him. And after he's preached, he tells his disciples in verse 35, let's cross over to the other side of the lake, the sea, the Sea of Galilee. They left the crowd, it says in verse 36, behind them. The disciples got into the boat, which Jesus was already sitting, and they took him with, he took him with them. So let's pause right here. Jesus finished preaching. Now he's getting onto the boat. So if we can visualize this, he's finished his time preaching. He gets on the boat. And the next thing the text says that he does is that he goes to sleep. 
Let's take another look at the story again. Verse 37. Suddenly, as they were crossing the lake, a ferocious storm arose with violent winds and waves that were crashing onto the boat until it nearly swamped them. But Jesus was calmly sleeping in the stern, resting on a cushion. So they woke him up saying, teacher, do you not even care that we are about to die? Now, let me stop here and teach for a moment because the Sea of Galilee at this time of year was no stranger to bad and heavy storms. Now, I'll tell you guys this. I'm new to Georgia, but I've gotten kind of used to the seasons that I've seen here thus far. Now, I'm from Washington, D.C., from Maryland. I've also lived in Louisiana, but it gets really hot here in the summer. I mean, this summer was my first summer, and it was getting to the 90s, even 100s. So you can kind of expect in Georgia in the summer that it's going to be pretty wet. Sometimes it gets humid. There's some, there's, some, there's some pretty bad storms I saw here this summer, but it also gets very hot. We know that during the fall here in Georgia, it's still kind of hot, but then around November or so, you start to see that kind of crispier air. Jesus knew the seasons like we know the seasons because he was a fisherman and he had a pretty clear view of the lay of the sea or the lay of the land, so to speak. So he knew what they were traveling, going into, that he knew what they would be traveling in. So the text says that this was Jesus' idea to go on this simple trip. But this simple trip turned into something, to at least the disciples, that was something dangerous and unexpected and even frustrating. And I think that's something that we all can connect with this morning. We plan to do something simple or something that's routine and even happy, and then our world is flipped upside down in an instant. I'll give you two examples this morning. A lot of us, we thought back a few moments ago to three or four years ago in 2019, where we thought that 2020 was going to be this great year. I remember going into one of my churches and people were talking about, this is the year that we're going to have 2020 vision. The members even had the funny 2020 glasses on and everybody said, we have perfect vision. We know what's going to happen. A few months later, COVID-19. And I don't have to tell you what happened. We all know the death that came about, the things that were shut down. We were afraid to go outside. We had to clean and disinfect our groceries. Our world was flipped upside down. A personal recollection that I had recently, my wife and I, we got married in August of 2022, and we didn't know where we were going to be for the longest time, so we just set a date because we didn't know where our assignment was going to be. And then the Southeastern uh, California Conference reached out to us, and they said, hey, we want you to minister in, in San Diego. So we said, awesome. But they said, we need you to be at work the day after you get married. And I was just like, well... Um, I said, I can't do that. We have, we have to travel. We have to get some things together. So they said, okay, we'll give you a three-day extension. So in giving me the three-day extension, we didn't have a honeymoon. And then we'll tell you, just be real, real with you, California's expensive, family. And so we didn't have any money to go on a vacation or do a honeymoon. And so when God blessed us to come to the Georgia Cumberland Conference, the cost of living went down, praise the Lord. And so we started to put some money away, and we, we said to ourselves, we said, we want to go on a vacation where we don't have to even think about the money that we're spending. So we, we put our, our money away, and we, we saved, and then a family emergency happened. And all of that money that we decided to put in went away. The interesting piece of dialogue that we see in this scripture kind of follows along the lines of something like this. Don't you care that we are dying? Now, I know that I'm in the midst of season Seventh-day Adventist Christians, and I know that a lot of you may never have wondered this type of a question, but the question simply is this, does God even care what I'm going through? Does God even care that I can put food on the table or that I'm trying to ration things to make enough money for rent? Does God know that I'm having trouble with taking care of an ailing parent or having problems with a wayward child? Does God even care? This isn't a statement of, Lord, help, I need help, but this is a question asking God, where are you? This is where their faith and now our faith is being tested, not just in God's power, but in his character. 
We're wondering why when we know God has the power to stop something, but he doesn't stop it. So I only have two points for us today, but point one is simply stop and know that God is who he says he is. Verse 39 says, so they shook him awake saying, teacher, do you not even care that we're going to all die? Fully awake, he rebuked the storm and shouted to the sea, hush, peace, be still. And at once the wind stopped howling and the water became perfectly calm. Then Jesus strongly rebuked his disciples saying, why are you so afraid? Haven't you learned to trust yet? But they were overwhelmed with fear and awe, and they said to one another, Who is this man who has such authority that even the winds and waves obey him? Now, this is some theological meat for you today, but it's pretty common sense, but here it is. God controls the weather, not man. Oh, you guys didn't catch it this morning. God controls the weather, not man. Here, Jesus is controlling and commanding the weather. He says, peace be still, and it was. And throughout the Bible, we see this. Even when Elijah prayed for it to rain, and it didn't, and then he prayed for it to rain, then it did, he didn't command anything. He prayed, and then he waited to see what God would do. One thing I often teach my my kids at Atlanta Adventist Academy is that Nothing you see in scripture will just be textual. It's scriptural. So that simply means that you're just not going to find one sentiment that God is trying to share through us, share to us through the word in one piece of scripture. He shows it all throughout scripture. Amen. I'm going to read a text for, for you in Psalm 107, and it details this. You just, just listen to this because it shows such amazing parallels. It says this in verse 23 of Psalm 107. Some of us set sail upon the sea to faraway ports, transporting our goods from ship to shore. We are witnesses of God's power out in the ocean deep. We saw breathtaking wonders upon the high seas. When God spoke, he stirred up a great storm, lifting the waves with high hurricane waves. Ships were tossed with swelling seas and rising to the sky, then dropping back down to the depths, reeling like drunkards, spinning like tops. Everyone was at their wits end until even the sailors despaired of life, cringing in terror. And then we cried out, Lord, help us, rescue us. And he did. God stilled the storm, calmed the waves, and he hushed the hurricane winds only to a whisper. Verse 30 says, we were so relieved, so glad that he guided us safely to harbor in a quiet haven. There we see an awesome parallel between Psalm 107 and now in Mark 4, where we find ourselves, where yes, we're reminded that yes, God controls the weather, but more importantly, God is in control. And here in Mark, we see him telling the stories of what Jesus did. He's the one. Yes, he's the one that can calm the seas. But in verse 40, they woke Jesus up because they were afraid. In verse 41, Jesus steals the water and calms the waves. But the disciples weren't good. They they weren't relieved. They weren't wiping the sweat from their brow. The text says that they were still very much afraid. And there we see two types of fear that we have to kind of grapple with. The fear of the winds of the waves and the, of the oncoming storm that they are dealing with. There's a word in the Greek called delo, which means to be fearful or lacking of courage. I think that's something that we can all identify where whether there's a physical storm or a spiritual storm or a personal storm in our lives where we're not ready. We're not ready to take on the thing that's coming towards us. We're, we're kind of cowering. We're kind of fearful like, God, where are you? What's going on? But God is challenging us. He's challenging them to display a different type of fear. And there's a Greek word for this type of fear called phabon, which means to revere God and to have the fear of God. The disciples were such astonishment that they knew already what, that God was who he said he was, that Jesus was who he said he was. But in this specific story, they get a real sense of Christ's deity. The disciples saw that unlike Elijah, he didn't have to pray. He just commands and calls the waves and the waters to be under control, and they were. They realized that 
he was the Messiah. And that's the point of this passage. They see that Jesus, who, is, who he is, who he says he is. Now, I probably, if I were you, I would be wondering, well, where's the rest in all of this part? Well, we're going to get to that second point here today. Again, I only have two points for you. But we have to recognize family who gives us the rest, true rest. See, family, we have to recognize Jesus for who he really is. He's really all caring, all knowing, all seeing, and he's in control. And let me say this before we get to our second and final point. Faith isn't having the knowledge that you'll be successful in whatever you do. But faith is simply believing that God is faithful no matter what happens. They said to Jesus, teacher, why do you not care that we are all going to die? And Jesus simply said back to them, why do you have no faith? What's the thing that they should have done? Simply, what should we do? Simply, trust God because we know him and believe that he cares for us. The second point. And my dad used to tell me this all the time. He said, you know, Jelani, you have a, a hard head. You have a very thick skull. And we're in Black History Month. We know that we are strivers. We have a lot that we've had to overcome. There's a lot of things, a lot of things that we have to do, and we don't think that we can rest. We have to just keep on going, keep on going. But point two is that we have to make the decision to rest. The first point was that we have to know who God is and believe him. But the second point is that we have to make the decision to rest. Yes, Jesus was, was and is fully divine. He's a part of the Godhead, but he was also human, human. Jesus got tired. Why? Because he worked hard. He had to preach and teach and heal. And he dealt with so many different people that wanted something from him. And I, as a pastor, I, I deal with all the different kinds of stuff that I deal with. But I know that Jesus must have had work exhaustion because even he had to go into the wilderness to rest. And even he, in this specific story, had to go to the back of the boat to rest. And even, I'll say this for free, we aren't Jesus, but hallelujah, we're connected to him. So because we're connected to him, we have full access to him. That means we have access to Jesus' peace of mind. And personally, I don't know about you, but all I want is God's peace no matter what's going on. I remember growing up, I would ask my mom, Mom, what do you want for your birthday? And she said, all I want is peace. And I'd say, Mom, you don't want flowers. You don't want to go out to eat. She said, Jelani, all I want is peace. And so now when I have my birthday, my wife asks me, babe, Jelani, what do you want? I said, all I want is peace. Because no matter what happens, good, bad, or indifferent, if I have God's peace, I'm good. And because we have all access to Jesus, that means we have access to the physical rest that Jesus had as well. Why? Because we are his. Jesus wants us to experience finding rest in him and if we want to see true growth in him, as we, like I said, are dealing as a church with growing in Christ, we have to learn how to rest in Christ. And so that means that we have to give up control and step aside and say, God, I need you to take the reins because I want to grow in you. But again, in order to find growth, we have to rest. I'm talking about rest this morning. Matthew 11, verse 28 says a familiar thing that most of us remember. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest for your souls. Jesus didn't say, come to me happy, cheerful, optimistic. It's quite the opposite. He says, come to me, all who are heavy laden and worn out. And the very thing that we should know about as Seventh-day Adventists and as Sabbath keepers is, keepers is that true rest is radical. Why? Because it's honest. We don't have to put on a show for Christ. We don't have to come all prim and proper whether we're distracted, numb, discouraged, downtrodden, whatever it is, we can come to God because he cares for us and he can take on our problems. And as I said, we as human beings, we have very thick skulls. We try to think that we can manage everything in life and we can plan everything out. But guess what? We have to remember that life is going to happen. Pandemics we saw are going to come. Jobs will be lost. Relationships will fail. Children will act up. Have mercy. I've been there. I was a child that act, acted up a lot. And now that I'm in the working world, I know that work gets hard and school gets taxing, but we've got 
to make the decision to rest. We've got to make the decision to trust God and know that he knows what he's doing. And because we can rest our minds, that can turn into rest for our bodies and for our souls. I just have a question for you guys today. How many of you guys want to rest in Jesus? How many of you want to grow in Jesus? Well, like I said, the the physical trainers will tell you that in order for you to grow, you have to learn how to rest. Sister White says this in The Desire of Ages, page 336. When thinking about this particular story that we find in Mark 4, when Jesus was awakened to meet the storm, he was in perfect peace. There was no trace or fear in the word or look, for no fear was in his heart. But he rested not in the possession of almighty power. It was not as the master of the earth and sea that he reposed in quiet, that power that he laid down. And he says, referencing John chapter 5, verse 30, I can, do, I can of myself do nothing. But Jesus trusted in his father's might. It was his faith, the faith in God's love and care that Jesus rested. And the power of that word, which stilled the storm, was the power of God. And Jesus rested by faith in the Father's care, so we are to rest in the Savior's care. If the disciples had trusted him, they would have been kept in peace. Their fear in the time of danger revealed their unbelief. And their efforts to save themselves, they forgot Jesus, have mercy. And it was only then when their despair of self-dependence, they turned to him to get the help that only he could give. How often the disciples' experiences are, as Sister White says, when the tempest of temptation gather and the fierce lightning flash and the waves sweep over us, we battle with the storm alone, forgetting the one who can help us. We trust in our own strength till our hope is lost and then we are ready to perish And then, she says, we remember Jesus, have mercy. And if we call upon him to save us, we shall not cry in vain. See, Sister White is saying what is so often our experience. We we try to do everything in our own strength. We try to just manage our own lives and deal with our own struggles and our own situations, thinking that we can have it all together, but family, we don't. And we're not that strong. We're not that wise as the, as the children's story talked about. God is all-knowing. God is all-caring. He's clever, too. When I think about Jesus in this moment on the boat, and I'm, I'm not going to disgrace the pulpit, but I just imagine Jesus just kind of laying his head on the cushion, as the Bible says. And, you know, sometimes there are people in life that, you know, back on TV when I was growing up, they just had these kids in high school that just look cool. They're always leaning on something. What, why they were leaning, I don't know why, but they were always leaning. And I imagine Jesus just kind of leaning on this cushion, but laying down, but, you know, just kind of leaning. Of course, he knew that there were winds were crazy and the waves were rocking, but he was just, just there chilling. As scripture says, as Sister White recounts, he could chill like that. He could lean like that because he knew who was in control, his father. And as we are choosing, as we saw the raised hands, or we're choosing to grow in Christ, and as we're choosing to rest in Christ, I want us to start leaning on God like that. When we see life storms coming, we can just say, okay, I'm just going to lean into God. I'm just going to choose to trust, to rest and trust God, even when things aren't looking too hot. The simplest thing I can say is that we have to learn to gaze at God and just glance at our problems. We serve an awesome God, Southside. And I just want to say a prayer over this sermon that as we journey forth from this day, that we can learn to cast, truly cast all of our cares on God for he cares for us. Let's pray, family. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your word. Your word not only just gives us stories about the biblical personalities that lived during that day, but also guidance for us 
so that we know that we can actually trust you with any and everything that may comes that may come in our life, Lord God, whether the the tempest is high, whether the waves are going like crazy, whether the winds may feel like they're going to knock us out, Lord God, we know that we can trust you. So right now, Lord God, we are choosing, we're making an active choice to trust you. Why? Because we know that you care for us. So I want to pray a special prayer over, over every child here, every man, every woman who is either on a long journey with you, they've been going with you for a long time, or even for those that are new to the faith, Lord God. Would you help renew our faith today, renew the rest that we have in you, knowing that when we put our trust in you, not that just everything will be all right, but that we're safe in your arms. This is our prayer in Jesus' name.